Good evening. My name is John Coates here in Natick, Massachusetts. This tape is part of the Morse Institute Library's Continuing Veterans Oral History Project. This is April 2nd, 2001, and this evening we are pleased to have with us Harry Christensen, Jr. Welcome. Well, thank you Glad very much. Glad to have you here with I'm us. I'm pleased to be here. Uh, to start out, may I ask you how old you are? I'm 54 today. Today? That's right. Tomorrow's my birthday. I'll be 55. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yes. <laughs> well, congratulations tomorrow. And your current you. address? In Marblehead, Massachusetts. And that's up on our North Shore. And current marital status? I'm married. And children? Two children. And grandchildren? No grandchildren. Oh, they'll Too probably, young for that. They'll probably be on the way one of these days. I'm afraid that's true. Where were you born, Harry? I was born in Marblehead, Massachusetts. So you're a born hometown, and raised. hometown boy up born there. Born and raised. Raised up there. Yes. And uh, tell us about the community that, uh, like all others, has probably changed. It's a very small community, 20,000 people to 25,000 people. Uh, over the last probably 30 years or so, there's been an influx of people from the Boston area. And so to some extent, it's um, a Boston bedroom community. But uh, when I grew up, it was a, a, a community made up of uh, blue-collar people, fishermen. Uh, my dad was a police officer. In the days when a police officer got, um, uh, if you were a police officer, you had to have another job as well to support your family. In fact, he did. He worked um, a shift as a policeman and as a carpenter as well. So he worked 16 hours a day as long as he was alive. Uh, so it was a very small, quaint town uh, on the coast on a peninsula, and usually people say, well, gee, Marblehead, that's a tough place to get into. And we always say, yeah, that's the way we like it that way. We're going to keep uh, it that way. That's, yeah. We'd like yeah. to keep it that way. Unfortunately, as I've said over the last 30 years or so, it's been a serious influx of people who think it's very quaint. And accordingly, the, the real estate values have gone sky high, and so has everything else. But it's uh, still the place I love, where my roots are. What about your mom? Uh, my mom was working all those hours. Uh, my mom stayed home because there were uh, six kids to take care of, uh, myself and five <coughs> younger. Uh, and uh, so she, she was home as long as I was alive, as long as my dad was alive. My dad died in 1981, uh, but my wife, uh, my, my wife, well, my wife, my mother continues on happily in Marblehead. Among your uh, Siblings here. Uh, did you have brothers, sisters? Yes, two brothers, we, three sisters. Two brothers and three sisters. Right, all younger. All than younger I. than you. Yeah. And you went to the uh, school system in that town. I did. I went through uh, Marblehead High School and graduated in 1965. Then I did a semester in college. And about that time, the Vietnam War was uh, becoming significant in the news. And I had always been brought up with the, um, the idea that if your country was at war, that's where you were supposed to serve. Consequently, I left college and joined the Marine Corps. Tell us about uh, being in high school. You were in high school in 64, uh, 65. Mm -hmm. Did you guys uh, talk about the impending pro probability that you would wind up in the service? I don't think so. It wasn't until graduation and my first year in college that that became a possibility. Accordingly, there were tests that were given um, for all students, at least in the beginning, to acquire an S1 category with the draft board student one year. Then you'd have to take the test again. They wanted to make sure, your draft board wanted to make sure that you were matriculated somewhere and not just dodging the draft. And I recall taking the uh, uh, taking the tests, and I recall vividly my dad saying, what are you doing? It's 11 o'clock, you haven't studied, you, you, you know, tomorrow you're taking these tests, this could mean you're going into the, the service. And I said, well, you know, well, what will be, will be. Legally, what concerned. were your um, options at that time so far as a, a draft was concerned? Well, at that time, I had a draft number. As you may recall, at 18, you had to register, and uh, I had a, 
a, a 1S category, or I think maybe it was 2S, I really don't remember, but it was because I went right from high school into college. My options were to A, stay in college, or B, drop out of college and very likely be drafted, uh, or to enlist, I guess, those th three options. What does 1S mean? Uh, one year student. So you had one year as a student, and then you had to reapply um, so that the draft board could ensure that year two you were still a student and matriculated. Um, otherwise, I suppose there were some people who you could get that category and just sit back and, and drop out of school and do whatever you wanted. So it was, um, as I remember, it followed up each year to make sure that you were still a student. At the end of one year of college, uh, you left school when you could have stayed in school? Is yes, I did. What, what, what went through your mind for that kind of a decision? That it wasn't right for me to be in a classroom while people were fighting um, for their country and people were being killed. It wasn't, I, I couldn't concentrate. Did you have a, a bunch of guys you palled around with or, or had met in, in college? Uh, one or two, I guess. Did you discuss this decision with them? No, not at all. Did, did you discuss it with your family? I did. And what was the uh, outcome there? Well, my mom wanted to stay in school. Um, I think more likely because, because I would be safe there. Uh, my dad really didn't say one way or another. He knew where I was coming from, and uh, he just didn't say much at all. My mom wanted me to stay, stay in school. school. Um, she felt that uh, joining the service, particularly the Marine Corps, could likely put me in harm's way, I'm sure. Your father was a policeman. He was. And uh, Can you tell us about sitting down and talking with him about that? And uh, You say he didn't have much to say about it. So is this decision pr pretty much your own? Yes, it was. And can you tell us what weighed you toward the Corps? Toward the Marine Corps? Yeah. Well, I felt that um, if I had to serve in the service, that I might just as well serve in the real service. <laughs> and the Marine Corps, for me, was the, uh, the service at that time. Of course, I'd, I'd grown up in the, uh, um, in the 50s and the early 60s when um, those people who fought wars were the Marine Corps, John Wayne and uh, uh, that group of people. And I thought that's what it was going to be like. And so, if you had to join the service at time of war, you might as well be in the first, you know, front ranks. Um, Tell us about enlisting. Where did that happen? That happened in uh, Salem, Massachusetts. Um, me and another, another and I, thumbed to Salem, and uh, this Marine recorder, uh, record, recruiter in the Salem post office, his name was Sergeant McGurk. That was 1960. Six, I guess, early in '66, uh, and we talked with him about joining the Marine Corps. What was our what were our chances to go to to go to Vietnam, and uh, what was the Marine Corps like, and and all of that. And we spent probably a couple of episodes with him, and then decided that that's what we wanted to do. What did McGurk tell you? What what were your odds against going or not going? Well, he said you're likely to go to Vietnam. Uh, all Marine. Uh, uh, enlistees are riflemen. You're going to go to Vietnam, you're going to be in combat. And he just kind of reiterated the old John Wayne, you're going to charge into combat on a white horse with your sabers flashing and no one really gets hurt, just a lot of noise and occasionally someone gets wounded but no one really gets hurt in a situation like that. Had McGurk been there? I don't think so. I don't recall. But I don't think so, looking back at it. I recall that only because when I came back from overseas, I had more ribbons than he did. <laughs> and he was a sergeant, he was a corporal. Who was this guy that went with you that day? His name was Roger Casey. And Roger and you signed up for the Marine Corps? We did. And did they take you immediately? They did. Well, no, there was a delayed, we were able to go in, we probably, I think we signed papers in like, I don't know, May of 1966 under what was called then the delayed entry program. And what that meant was you had like 90 days of your actual service was underway, uh, but you didn't have to leave for boot camp until 
the end of that 90-day period. It was something like that. Maybe it was 120 days. So that, that would take you in in August? Well, I, I know I went down in December. So whatever 90 or 120 days is prior to December 6, that's the day we left. I know that vividly. So whatever, and I don't remember if it was 90 or 120 days, but the idea was that you could join and your active duty would begin um, a substantial period of time before you had to show up. That was the idea. What was your contract with the Corps? Four years. Four years. Yes, sir. So in uh, 66, you were signing up till the year 70. And they, took, they didn't take you till December. What did you do in the meantime? Back to school or what? Uh, no, I got ready for um, four years in the Marine Corps. I kind of hung around a bit. I know that um, Shades of the Deer Hunter, uh, I went deer hunting for the last time. Uh, and that was probably late October, early November of 1965. Uh, I'd hunted with my dad from the time I was eight or nine years old, I guess. And this was my last opportunity for a deer hunt before I went into the service. So we did that. And, you know, I chased my girlfriend around and uh, just kind of took it easy. Can you go back mentally for us tonight and tell us what you thought as the, the days were dwindling down to the precious few, as, as we say, what was on your mind? You're, you're saying goodbye with your father to one aspect, to your lady friend uh, to another aspect. Did you feel something coming your way or that you were leaving something? Well, I thought maybe I'd made a mistake. Four years was a serious commitment and uh, having 90 days or 120 days to think about it caused me to think, gee, you know, maybe I could have, uh, now I'm realizing that there's a six month reserve program in the Marine Corps and perhaps I could have uh, opted for that. Four years is a heck of a commitment. I've just got out of high school and I thought that would, that seemed to last, those four years seemed to last forever. Uh, four years I'm going to be away from my mother, my father, the woman that I love. This is going to be really difficult. Uh, maybe I've made a mistake. That's Did you make any uh, effort to rectify that mistake? No. So they got you. They got me. Yeah. For sure. Tell us about going to Paris Island. Well, it was, uh, I remember uh, we went to uh, South Station in Boston. Uh, we met several other kids that were from various areas of the um, metropolitan Boston area. Uh, and the first time I had a train ride, got on a train in South Station with uh, berths. I never realized that there were beds on trains until this trip. Uh, woke up, went to bed, woke up, Washington, D.C. Got off of the train, there was someone waiting for us, a very kind person that got us onto another train that was uh, more like a cattle car, uh, box cars with wooden seats in them. Uh, we got into those things and traveled through Virginia down to South Carolina. And I remember thinking, oh my God, what have I got myself into? I was uh, looking out the window all the way down, looking at these shacks with people barefoot with rag, wearing rags and living in uh, tar shacks. Uh, I was appalled. I thought that I, um, that, that I wasn't in um, the United States any longer. Well, what is this all about? This is absolutely terrible. Uh, where do these people live? What, uh, I was just, uh, I was awakened, I guess, you know, living in Marblehead all of my life or uh, anywhere uh, where you don't see that kind of thing. It's a rude awakening. And things got worse. Things went downhill from there. Yeah. <laughs> For sure. You got the Yamasee. <laughs> Indeed. The neighborhoods changed. How large a group were you in when you went down on that train? On the train? Yeah. Probably 30 guys. That's, that's it, about one car, car load? I think so. Okay. They'd stop every 700 miles or so and, and bring you in a little bit of fried chicken or something. I remember being hungrier than I had been in my entire life. That went downhill fast, too. <laughs> Now, get off the train. Uh-huh. Uh, did you go over on the, uh, uh, did you take the uh, barge over? No. Bus took a bus. Over, walk over? Took yeah. a bus from the train station. Uh, again, a very kind guy. 
I don't remember if he was a, a drill instructor. No, it couldn't have been a drill instructor. Very nice guy. I got us off the train on the bus. Uh, and uh, the next thing I knew, that was 2 o'clock in the morning, something like that. Uh, we're at the front gate of Paris Island. And I'm looking, I'm thinking, ooh. And I had seen the, um, the, the DI with Jack Webb shortly before going over. And I said, you know, this is going to be kind of fun. These guys are really going to kid us, and it's going to be kind of fun. This is going to be experience. You were right. Um, it was an experience, but it was not fun. <laughs> not in any way at all. Tell us about walking through the gates 2 o'clock in the morning. Uh, going to the mattress factory or whatever they did with you? Well, the first thing was uh, the bus drove us through the gates to uh, uh, an area, and there was a fellow there with a Smokey the Bear cap on waiting for us. Uh, all of a sudden, he started screaming. And I don't know whether it was first or the middle or last getting off that bus, but people were flying off the bus. There are yellow footprints that uh, he's screaming at you with the most horrible obscenities that you have ever heard in your entire life. And I thought that I had heard everything. I, I didn't heard half of what this guy was screaming at us. And that was um, the chaplain, right? Um, and it <laughs> probably was the chaplain. This was the drill instructor. that, that um, And up and down he went, uh, pulling on people's hair, pushing people in the face, hitting people, kicking people. Um, it was horrible. It scared the... Um, but Jesus out of me. And we went from there to an area where they uh, checked all of our pockets to make sure that there wasn't any contraband. Um, and they found some, and those poor people. Um, we took all of our clothes off, and uh, standing there in our underwear, and they, they uh, believe they had some skivvies for us, and that's about all. We went to sleep. Uh, we woke up at the crack of dawn with another crazy person screaming horrible things at us, obscenities. Uh, and I want to tell you, when some, and, and they weren't kidding. They looked like psychotic killers. That it wasn't, it wasn't fun at all, uh, as I recall from the movie. It was, I was scared to death, absolutely scared to death. I didn't know what the fellow was going to do next. How old were you then? I was uh, 19. Had anything ever remotely in your life happened to you like this? Absolutely nothing. I'd never been in a situation like that in my entire life. If I could have gotten out of it, I would have done so in a minute. I can recall somewhere in the process of physicals, uh, one of the kids said to me, uh, they're giving me the option of going home. And I said, why? How? Why? And he said, well, I've got a pin in one of my fingers. And that they, they think that physical training might, might dislodge the pin. And I was thinking, oh, wow, I wish there was something that I had that had a pin in it that I could get out of this thing. I was absolutely terrible. Um, at one point, I, I wanted to call my mother and father and say, look, whatever you can do, Dad, you've got some kind of pull. Get me out of this. I've made a serious mistake. This is a terrible place. Uh, terrible, terrible place. I've never been so homesick in my life. I've never been so hurt, lonely. Um, it was just absolutely terrible. Hated it. You're part of a platoon now. Yeah. Um, how many guys in the platoon? Thirty. I don't remember. I'll be honest with you. The group that was with you on the train. Were you together with them? No, not they at all. They mixed in with others. Uh, Roger Casey was with me. The fellow that I had joined with. Yeah. We had joined uh, again. One of the conditions that we joined with was under the buddy program. You could stay together. Um, again, they lied to us because he was only with us. He was only with me for about three weeks. And did you was, think of Sergeant McKirk about this time? Yes, I did. Did you? Often. Yeah. Tell us what's your typical day at Paris Island in 1966? Okay. Um, this drill instructor would come through the uh, squad bay screaming horrible things at you, banging against the, the we're sleeping in r metal racks with a mattress and a pillow, one blanket, and a sheet, I guess, um, screaming. It's still dark. It had to be 4 o'clock in the morning. Probably was 5. But um, you had to get up. You had to be in front of your rack in your underwear, standing at attention until he walked down there and he was satisfied that everyone was up and standing at attention. Then you had one minute to get into your clothes, your, um, to go to chow. 
and uh, then you'd run down and line up, and anyone not running would be subjected to um, either some kind of corporal punishment or physical therapy. Um, you know, the fellow would say, all right, you get down. You left your, your cover, your hat, inside there. Uh, get down and give me push-ups. How many? Nine million of them. You know, that kind of thing. Just uh, outrageous things. So they'd, they'd run you to the chow hall. You'd go through uh, and, and get chow. And that was the best time of the, for me. I loved that. Uh, I was about 90 pounds, ate everything that I could. Uh, every so often, a drill instructor would come up behind someone, push his face in his meal, or pull his hair back, spit it out, spit it out, and, and you know, do awful things to you. I thought they were, they were um, uh, the harassment uh, was uncalled for. Um, in fact, when I left, I wrote a letter to them. They asked you to um, uh, critique your stay at Paris Island. And I had one year of, of college, and I was talking about the psychotic, the individual who needed therapy that was our drill instructor. <laughs> um, How long were you at Paris Island? Uh, oh, wow. December, January, February. Four, eight, 90 12. Days. 12 weeks. Yeah, and how long were you there before you be, before it dawned on you what they were trying to make out of you? Probably the first month. After that, I knew what they were doing. Um, uh, the first month or so, I was just scared. I was being hit. I was being screamed at. I remember I fell down one time. I was having terrible stomach cramps. The fellow kicked me, kicked me, bloodied my nose. Um, I just thought I was in prison or something. Uh, and then all of a sudden it came together what they were doing. Uh, they were preparing us for, for combat. Did you take a series of tests at PI? I'm sorry? Did, did I? Did you take a series of tests? Yes. Uh, to find out where you were going to fit in the core? I did. Uh, how'd you do there? I did pretty well. Um, it's a long story. I was, uh, strangely enough, I had uh, worked in a garage my last year in high school. <clears throat> and given that, my, I think it's called the GQT test, General Qualifications Test, uh, fell probably within the average range. <clears throat> Accordingly, they looked at what kind of experience I had. And I had some experience as a mechanic. And so they decided that I would be great as a tank mechanic. So right out of uh, Paris Island, I was told that I would go to Camp Lejeune for infantry training for four weeks. weeks. And then I would go to California, where the 3rd uh, Marine uh, Division 3rd Tanks was at Camp Pendleton uh, to learn to be a tank mechanic. Okay. At PI, uh, before we leave there, mm -hmm. you sit down and talk somebody to somebody about uh, the test that you had taken. Did you? Were you ever given any choice as to what you were doing? No, in not the at all. Or no. They, they wanted you to get into a tank group. Evidently. Yes, sir. Yeah. So you went to Lejeune for, did you get home after PI? Did no, you get any I went furlough? to Camp Lejeune first. Okay. For four weeks, infantry training. We learned to shoot bazookas, to fire the bazooka. We learned the difference between 60 and 80 millimeter mortars, how to fire them. Learned to um, fire the Browning automatic rifle, the Thompson. Um, artillery, mines, booby traps, um, various uh, automatic weapons, 50s, 30s, the new M60, that was new then, uh, the M16 pistols, we did a little uh, qualifying, those of us that were going into tanks qualify with a pistol, um, of course at Paris Island you had to qualify with a rifle or you couldn't leave there. Uh, and uh, uh, night marches, uh, using a compass, um, jungle training, uh, how to survive uh, overnight, uh, that kind of thing. When you were at Lejeune, it, uh, you, you, knew when, uh, you knew at that time you were going to be in tanks. Yes, sir. And then you went home from there for a few days? I went home for like, like three weeks, I think. Three weeks? In and March. Then, and then back there and then out to the coast. Right. Then uh, I had orders for Camp Pendleton, Camp uh, Tank School in April of 1967. <clears throat>
Would you please to wind up in tanks, no. or would you rather I wanted to have done fight. anything else in the world? <laughs> anything else in the world. I wanted to fight. I didn't want to repair motors. You were going to be a repair guy in tanks. Were you going to ride in tanks or fight in tanks? No. I was going to stay back at the uh, barn and grease the um, engines and make sure that the tank was uh, in good working order, uh, spark plugs, that kind of thing. That's what I thought I was going to do. But fate stepped in. <clears throat> At Camp Pendleton? Mm -hmm. I Tell us about fate here. I went through all but the last two weeks of tank mechanic school, and uh, we then had orders for, for Vietnam, all of us. Well, I wanted to go home first before I went to Vietnam. And coming up at that time, if you look at your calendars, the um, 4th of July that year fell on a Friday. So I went to the sergeant that was in charge of us said, look, I'd like to be able to uh, leave a little early Thursday. That way I've got Friday off, Saturday, Sunday. I'll be back Monday. I want to fly home, say goodbye to my girlfriend and my parents because we're going to Vietnam. And um, I think they were going over the end of August. No, the end of July. No, you can't do it. It's, there's not enough time, so forth and so on. Well, I went anyway. Um, you went over the hill? Well, no. I, I left Thursday uh, after hours. And uh, I got home probably late Thursday night, early Friday morning. I stayed home Friday, Saturday. And then I said, um, there's, there's no way I'm going to get back on time. I might as well stay until Monday. That put me over the hill for Monday. By the time I got back, it was Tuesday. I reported to the um, company commander, uh, and he asked me why I was late getting back. And he said, didn't we tell you that this would happen? And I said, sir, at that time, the uh, um, Egypt and Israel were at war. And I said, my, my girlfriend was Jewish. And I said, you, uh, sir. I've got a Jewish girlfriend, and he said, and I suppose you're Egyptian. And I said, no, no, no. He said, well, we can't bust you because you're a private. You don't have any rank. So what I'm going to do is uh, fine you. Well, in those days, I think I got $25 every two weeks. So to fine me was the worst possible thing that he could do. But I had missed three or four days of essential training in the tank mechanics school. So I dropped out of that class. The next class coming through that was even vaguely um, close to it was the tank crewman school. Those can are the you, guys can that. Can you hold it a second there? Sure. Go on back home. Uh, you're with your girlfriend, your family, yeah. and you got Vietnam right on your doorstep. Was there any discussion, thought, anything about not going back? None. You knew you were going to go back? Absolutely. And in fact, my dad said to me, I know you don't have orders, and I know you're over the hill. And I want to know when you're going back. And I said, well, I'm waiting for Marcy, that was my girlfriend, to come back. She's due back on Monday, Dad. And he said, I want you to go now. I'll take you to the airport, and you'll go now. And I was very, I was very unhappy about that. I wanted to wait for my girlfriend. Monday, I'll go back. I'm not trying to avoid anything. I'm going back. I just want to see her one more time before I go back. Um, you're going now. He took me to the airport. Off I went. I never did get to see her. Um, but again, I saw her Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday. I think she'd gone away to look at a college for the weekend. It wasn't due back on Monday. But I had seen her, and we'd said our last goodbyes. And it was time for me to go back. But there was never a question of mine not going back. I was uh, really wanted to go back. Uh, I wasn't happy about being a tank mechanic, but I, I, I knew that what I had to do um, and uh, I made the commitment, and I knew that I had to do it. Okay, that, now, get, now get to the part about you're now a tank crewman. Right. Um, and I said, a crewman? What's, those are the guys that ride the tanks. Whoa, this is what I wanted to do. I couldn't have planned it any better. So I went through uh, two-thirds of the, almost 95% of the tank mechanic school. Then I went through four weeks of tank uh, crewman school. Maybe you know, it was like four weeks. Um, 
And I graduated from that school. Then uh, we were sent to a place at Camp Pendleton called Los Pogos. That was uh, jungle training and tank jungle training. That was uh, kind of like Camp, Pendel Camp Lejeune, except that it was more um, acclimated to the Vietnam theater, mm -hmm. jungle, uh, the kind of booby traps, uh, the kind of snakes that we would see there, um, tigers, um, extensive first aid, um, how to take the, the weapons apart and put them together uh, when they were muddy, wet, uh, that kind of thing. It was in the desert in uh, uh, Camp Pendleton, and I mean the desert. You'd be out there, uh, it seemed like it was 20 degrees at night, uh, snakes, scorpions, uh, these big, big spiders that look like crabs uh, crawling all over you. And uh, then in the morning, it was, before you knew it, it was 110 degrees. It was unbelievable. Uh, they were preparing us for Vietnam. As part of the training there, uh, did you train with infantry that would give you support as infantry No, support? not in that context. We were all infantry, other than the tank, learning to fire the tank, the, um, uh, to coordinate with the tank commander, the various jobs, the, the driver, the loader, the gunner, and the tank commander. Uh, there was absolutely no training, and this was really going to, going to um, make an impact on us in Vietnam. There was no training at all with um, armor infantry, none. And that's what we did in Vietnam primarily. Mm -hmm. They really missed the boat on that. That's about the one thing I think that the Marine Corps did not prepare me for. Um, other than that, what they did to me at Paris Island uh, and what I learned there in Camp uh, Lejeune and Camp Pendleton, I couldn't have been more prepared for what I was going to see. Uh, other than that, joint, the joint operation of um, infantry, armor, and air support. They often came into conflict with one another and that mm -hmm. caused some serious trouble. What was your job on the tank? Well, the, I was in Vietnam for five months. First month, I was um, a loader. I would load the um, ammunition, 40, 40 uh, what am I saying, 90 millimeter rounds into the breach uh, upon the command of whatever they wanted. If they wanted a HE high explosive, you'd pull out that round. If they wanted a canister, you'd pull out that round and throw that in. There was another round that was used for anti-tanks, but the North Vietnamese had a few tanks and, the, and they didn't play around with them, so I never didn't see it, a North Vietnamese tank or a Russian tank the whole time I was there. Um, some of the old timers that were there, my first month or two, about talk T-34 tanks that they had seen in the DMZ, but I'd never seen one. So we just those two major rounds, H E Europe. Um, then I went to Gunner. I was very good with a machine gun. Uh, very, very good with it. So they, let's see, probably I loaded for Tell us about shipping out in the first place, uh, getting over there. I'm sorry? Tell us about going over in the first place. Did okay. you go as a unit? Uh, went with a unit. There were very, um, uh, very different numbers of people, some tankers, some recon people, some infantry, some foreign language people. Uh, we went to the air base at, it's in California. Travis? Travis Air Force Base. Mm -hmm. Uh, and there, there was a, uh, a commercial aircraft that took, oh, I don't know, three or four hundred of us in a commercial aircraft to Hawaii. We landed there, refueled from there to Okinawa, and we stayed overnight in Okinawa. Then from Okinawa to Da Nang. I mean, bam, 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 bam. Uh, I found myself in Da Nang. Um, alone uh, with orders, uh, showing them to someone, and they must have, I don't remember this really well, I was writing my memoirs, uh, I'm in the process of it, and that's a blank to me, I don't remember, there must have been a terminal or something where you reported and said, here's my orders, okay, you're going to Fubai. So from Da Nang, we took a um, C-130 flight up to Fubai, landed there, that's where the third Marines were. Uh, from Fubai, Charlie Company, third tanks was at Fubai. Uh, 
we messed around a little bit there. Stood guard duty, kind of got the language, the um, language was really kind of important. From there, we had to decide which group of third tanks we were going to. Charlie Company was in the rear at Fubai. Alpha Company was at Contien, bad, getting ba badly mauled. Bravo Company was at Camp Carroll, also getting hit badly. I wanted to go to Alpha Company, so I volunteered for Alpha Company. I'm going to go to Vietnam, she wants to fight. Um, I got Bravo Company. So we took a C-130 from Fubai that landed in Dong Ha. And uh, Dong Ha is up in Quang Tri Province. From there, uh, a six by a big truck uh, took me and I think two others up to Camp Carroll along Highway 9, um, all the way up past Way through Quang Tri City uh, to Camp Carroll, which is, I don't know, 10 miles south of the DMZ. Uh, Can you take a minute to tell us about the DMZ? What is what was the DMZ? DMZ is the 17th parallel. It's a, it's a demilitarized zone, supposedly 20 miles south and 20 miles north uh, was supposed to be demilitarized. You weren't supposed to, um, it wasn't supposed to be any active uh, uh, fighting in that area. But of course the North Vietnamese were into the DMZ and, and south of the DMZ. And so um, they weren't playing the game, so we decided that we wouldn't either. We were, uh, many times I was into uh, North Vietnam. Not many times, but a few, I guess. You're with a specific outfit now, and you know you're going to be with these guys for a while. These are the 3rd Marine Division? Yes, sir. And the 3rd Tanks? 3rd Tanks. Is that just the nomenclature for it, the 3rd Tanks? 3rd Tank Battalion. Yeah. 3rd Marine Division, uh, Bravo Company. I was with B Company. Okay, you were in Bravo Company, and w did you specifically have a, a tank that was yours? I did. And a, a bunch of guys that, this is your, your boys now. Right. There were two platoons, uh, first platoon and second platoon, uh, in Bravo Company. And then there was two tanks that were um, designated to um, defend the CP. Mine was one of them was headquarters, um, Bravo 4 Deuce. It was a gun tank with a big blade on the front like a bulldozer. The other tank that was designated to protect the CP was a, was a dragon, a flame tank, napalm tank. First platoon, one platoon at a time went into the field um, to an outbase at the rock pile. Uh, and the other, they would rotate on a regular basis. Sometimes they needed the um, blade tank out there as well, so we would go. The blade tank was great in that it probably weighed an extra 15 tons or so. And so if you put that blade tank in the front, it would absorb a, an awful lot of concussion in the event that you hit a mine. What kind of tanks were these? M48A3s, the uh, Patton tank. 90 millimeter cannon with a 50 caliber either sky mounted on the top of the turret or out through the tank commander's cupola, which is a bubble on the top of the turret. And uh, we had a 30 caliber as well and everything else that you could carry. We usually had, I had an AK-47, I had a grease gun, I had a Thompson, I had a shotgun, I had a, um, a, a bunch of grenades, everything that you could get you carried on there. Um, sometimes. You mentioned the rock pile a minute ago. Yeah. Um, this is 10 miles from the southern border of the DMZ, is that about right? That's about right, I guess. Describe the rock pile. Oh, the rock pile was a hellish place. Um, between Camp Carroll and the DMZ, in essence, it was um, a series of trenches uh, covered over with plywood and tarps, hooches we called them, where you could get inside and, and uh, uh, get out of the rain. Uh, there was probably, I don't know, a company of people there. Mortars, um, no heavy artillery, um, short mortars, uh, 60 millimeter mortars, a uh, company of men, uh, a couple of tanks, maybe three tanks, uh, and that was about it. That's the outside the perimeter, that's Indian country. Um, bad place to be. What was, 
what were you, what were you supposed to do? You're an outpost to, you're an early warning. Um, and it was a stop off, it was a, it was on the stage route. We would, um, uh, Dong Ha was a major, uh, a major area, a uh, supply area. They'd run convoys from Dong Ha up to Camp Carroll and then along Highway 9 up to Geo Lin in the northeast corner of the DMZ or to the rock pile and then Kalu, which was uh, um, even closer to the DMZ, five miles maybe into the DMZ, or west of there to uh, Quezon and Contien. They were outposts, early warning is what they would be, listening posts. They'd be overrun, they were expendable um, uh, areas, and it would let your major areas know that something was coming. So That's you were serving were. as a tripwire uh, out there That's all. Uh, in two tanks? And you're loaded for bear. Did you begin to see the uh, the North Vietnamese army? Did, uh, who did you shoot at? Who did you find? Um, it was, t you never saw the army. Um, the tanks acted as support for convoys from one of these outposts to the other. Um, it was difficult to get helicopters in. Now obviously there, there were no airstrips so they couldn't get aircraft in. So they'd begin with helicopters, but the helicopters were being shot down pretty readily with, with just automatic weapon fire and RPG fire, the rocket propelled grenades. So um, they were using tanks as security. They'd put one in the front, supply trucks, another tank, tank in the rear, and would run from one area to another. We'd be ambushed. You'd see them occasionally, but not as an army. It was an ambush site more than anything else. Um, even at uh, Quezon, when we were surrounded, you'd have to use binoculars and occasionally you could see them running from uh, one trench to another trench, but uh, very unusual to see uh, a full-scale attack with uh, 50, 100 to uh, 10,000 people coming at you. It was very, very different, very confused, very, very confused. Can you describe a typical run uh, when you're in one of these convoys? Are you the lead tank? Or, uh, Usually I was yeah. the lead tank. In talk that talk we about had the, that. Tell we us had about the, going into territory like that. Well, it depended where you were going. Um, you had a false sense of security. Um, if you were running from Dong Ha to Camp Carroll, very unusual that you'd take any sniper fire at all. There was always the thought of tank, of, of mines. And some of the mines, they were using, uh, B-52s were dropping these big 500-pound bombs on them. Uh, occasionally, some of them were duds. And they'd take them and make them active again and put them in the road. The tank would go over, they'd blow the turret right off the tank and kill everybody inside. There was always a little bit of fear, but when you're 19, you don't think about that kind of thing. You just think about you're driving along at 35 miles an hour in a tank and nothing can stop you. Your goggles over your helmet and you've got a scarf around your neck. There's no, one's, no one can hurt you. You're John Superman. Wayne. Did you ever have occasion to call in air support? No. Medivacs. The last day that I was there, we needed air support, and I was too badly hurt to call it in. Um, I've called in medevacs a number of times. Um, we, we really couldn't get much. It, it was really difficult in the jungle to call in air support because we were spread all over the place. And uh, I saw too much of that stuff where people get hurt that weren't supposed to get hurt. If somebody's down and you're calling in a medevac, uh, you're waiting for a chopper to come, then you, do you stop the convoy? It depends. If you're in the middle of the ambush, you keep going. You keep going. Uh, you keep going. You run over people, you kill people, your own people. Um. Okay, and it's up to the choppers to find you. Right. Uh, did you see guys lifted out, take off from your unit? Yeah. Did you ever hear from them again? Um, some. How far away was the uh, nearest medical attention that they could get? Well, uh, the rock pile, every Every, uh, Camp Carroll had a MASH center, but it was, excuse me, basic first aid. Uh, the rock pile had a MASH. They had one corpsman and a doctor. 
I know I was treated at the rock pile at one time. I had a white phosphorus burn in my arm. Um, but it was rudimentary first aid. From there, the closest that I know of, only through my own experience, was Dong Ha, the big center down at Dong Ha. It had to be, I don't know, 30 miles or so to the south. Can you Not talk much. about being wounded? How did, how did you get white phosphorus on you? Um, we were, my tank was alone with a company of infantry in an outpost called the Fishbowl. We were bait. Um, we went across the Camlo River to a um, place that we called the Fishbowl. We called it the Fishbowl because these gigantic mountains on both sides that are shaped, uh, I don't know, like a witch's hat. And you kind of feel like you're inside of a fishbowl. Uh, anyway, uh, my tank and a company of, it was India Company, 3rd Marines, I, I can't remember their battalion number, but we were out there for a week or so. Um, I was terrified the whole time that I was out there. We had to call in um, artillery on a regular basis from there, but that was from Camp Carroll. Um, we evacuated that place and we were ordered to um, destroy all of our bunkers, all of our trenches, uh, all of our hooches, sandbags. Uh, my tank had a blade on it, and so we were, we were um, uh, blading that stuff in. And we started to get some in incoming mortars, the big, those big North Vietnamese mortars, the 82 millimeter mortars. Uh, and I wanted to get out of there. So I was ground guiding the tank on the outside, on the fender of the tank, and, and uh, one of the rounds that came in was white phosphorus, Willie Peter we called it. And uh, it hit me in the arm, uh, wounded me in the arm. When we got back to the rock pile, uh, I sought attention there. It wasn't that bad. It hurt. <laughs> it it, it kind of smarts a little, doesn't it? I've got to burn that size on my arm still from it, a scar there, like that. What other side? You, well, you were a corporal about now? Um, just about, yeah. Second stripe? Just about that time. I got to Vietnam as a private. Next month, I was a private first class. The next month, I was a lance corporal. And the next month, I was a corporal. Why? Because I was so talented? Uh-uh. Because the guys in the tank were killed. And they needed somebody with a month's experience or a two months' experience. By the time I had three months' experience, um, I was tank commander. We didn't have officers that commanded our tanks because um, we just didn't have them. Uh, the platoon leader that took care of the first platoon, four tanks, was a second lieutenant. We didn't have one for headquarters. So of the flame tank and the blade tank, um, I was a tank commander of one, and there was another fellow who was a tank commander of the um, uh, flame tank. It seems to no me No officers. you had to get pretty savvy pretty fast. Pretty fast. And you were now a, a, a corporal in the United States Marine Corps. Did it make sense to you some of the things that were happening to you out there? Uh, you, 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 you're being used as a tripwire. Uh, you're being out there as bait. Did that make sense? I didn't think about that at all. Not once did I think about that. I worried about how I was going to live through the night <laughs> or the day. I didn't think about any of that. Did you guys do things that you weren't supposed to do all the because time. you knew it was the better thing to do? Yes, sir. You, d you said to hell with the orders. Uh, yes, we, know, we know better. Right. Can you give us an example of that? Well, um, yeah. I'm at the rock pile. My tank is online. Uh, the enemy is no, no more than 20 feet away from us. Barbed wire, Constantina wire. Um, four guys that were supposed to be a listening post, they're supposed to go outside of the wire and set up a listening post, come into my tank, and they're shaking, they're scared. Uh, Chris, can we come inside of your tank? We had a hooch there. Can, you come, can we come inside the hooch? We're scared, there's an awful lot of activity out there and we'll call in our situation reports from here. Absolutely, come right in, guys. Um, oftentimes, we'd be told to do something on the radio, and we'd do what was gonna save our lives. Um, 
And then you do stupid things to one occasion. You knew that there were booby traps everywhere. I remember being on the road from, where was it? It must have been from Camp Carroll to the rock pile. And there was one of these straw hats in the road. And I wanted it for a souvenir. So um, uh, this is a terrible thing. The, um, my loader had just gotten to Vietnam. And I said, Tracy, get, I stopped the tank. Tracy, get down and get that hat for me and bring it back. And as he's running to it, I said, oh my God, if that's booby trapped and blows his head off, I'll never, I'll never live. Thank God it wasn't. I don't know how it got there. It just was, out, it was something very much out of place. And I knew better. And, you know, um, C rations. You weren't supposed to take C rations if you weren't in the field. We took them because we needed them. You weren't supposed to use gasoline. You weren't supposed to take gasoline on the tank because of the explosive. But they were great with those little gasoline stoves, so we took them. Um, if we were told, um, oftentimes there was incoming rockets or artillery or mortars. Not, not, a, not a lot, but a few. Uh, we had things to do, and so we're told to take cover. We, we did those things anyway. Um, we weren't supposed to get drunk. We got drunk as much as we could. You weren't supposed to make your own jungle juice. We made jungle juice. There were southern boys that could make jungle juice from raisins, from peaches, from bananas. Um, we were supposed to take malaria tablets every Sunday. <laughs> right over your shoulder went the malaria tablet with the hope that we would get malaria and get out of there. Um, you name it. Uh, we had New Year's Eve, we uh, lit up the hill with um, these little flares that you shoot up. Uh, the company commander nearly killed us. Um, uh, I remember drawing names to see who was going to the officers club at Camp Carroll and get a bottle of scotch because we were tired of drinking the jungle juice and beer. Um, yeah, we did a lot of things that weren't. We used to use C4 to, uh, for maintenance on the tank, explosive. Um, there's a torsion bar that's like a shock absorber. There are six of them that run through the tank. Um, and if one breaks and they broke off, then you have to pull it out with like a wheel puller. Uh, oftentimes, you couldn't pull it out. It would break off inside there. So we'd use C4, like a cherry bomb, pack it in there, screw on, leave a little bit hanging out, light the fuse, and run it, or blow the torsion bar. I mean, yeah, stuff like that. Um, Did you have no officers within a thousand miles no, of sir. you? I never saw a dead officer the whole time I was there, till the last day I was there. How about live ones? Uh, didn't see many of those either. Where was everybody? I don't know. I, I do know. Uh, there were, at the CP at Camp Carroll, the command post at Camp Carroll, second lieutenant, Lieutenant Himes, was in the field with us all of the time. Uh, my company commander was from Arlington, I think. His name was Captain Kent, Captain. He was in the comm bunker, communications bunker, all sandbagged. The executive officer was in the comm bunker. He was a first lieutenant. Uh, sergeant Major, first sergeant, he was in the comm bunker. They never left there. The five months that I was in Vietnam, our captain left the comm bunker once and got killed. He was with me. He was on my tank running into that ambush. Um, he was about ready to go home. He had a couple of small kids. Uh, was looking for a Purple Heart or something, I guess. He got one, all right. This is probably going to be the, the dumbest question anybody asked you, but what was the greatest challenges you faced in combat? Well, it's, uh, there are periods of it, of combat. There are periods when you're drawn to it, where you don't see people getting hurt, where you're dealing it out. And those are exhilarating kinds of things that, that you hit the bullseye at Paris Island. Um, and you get a, you know, a flag goes up. It's that kind of thing. The other and extreme is when you're all out of courage. You're, the, you're at the end of the rope, and you're so scared that you can't uh, think. So um, I guess making sure that you get your people back, and your people, I mean the people in the tank and the grunts, the infantry that are with you, um, back without getting hurt, that's exhilarating. Um, payback is exhilarating. Um, being able to hit back was exhilarating. 
oftentimes these guys wouldn't fight with you in the open. They would, uh, of course, I don't blame them. That you know, infantry and we're tanks uh, with all kinds of sophisticated weapons did hit us uh, from behind trees and in elephant grass, uh, and then run off before that we could really strike back at them. And so getting a piece of them, I guess, was the most exhilarating thing for me. And occasionally it happened. And it was a very, it was very, it was exhilarating, I guess. Although looking back on it, you know, kill, killing people is not a very nice thing. Um, How about the other side of that? Were, were there moments when you felt this is it? Yeah, I'm not going to get out of this, that they, they're, absolutely. they're throwing grenades in my tank or something? Yeah, well, Can I you never had that like experience. That? But um, other than, you know, occasionally it's really scary when it, rounds are coming in. They call them incoming rounds, whether they be mortars or artillery. You never know where they're going to land. And after a while, it's kind of fun. It's like playing bombardment. With, do you know what bombardment is? Throw the ball across the line, try to hit someone. Kind of neat. But then when you see someone with this, that's, that's dead, um, it doesn't get neat anymore. It gets scary. And as they come in, you hear one. And, and depending on whether they're mortars or artillery, you can tell when they're, where they're coming from. You can hear the, them leave the gun tube in the case of mortars. Dunk! And you can tell they, they'll hit, and then they'll hit, and they say, Jesus, that's 50 yards. That's, I'm next. It's coming right in on me, and you get scared. The worst part is the ambush sites, um, not knowing exactly when it's going to come, but knowing that it's going to come is really scary. And when you're a tank commander, you have to have the upper half of your body outside of the tank so that you can see right, left, behind you, in front of you. Uh, and it's really very, very difficult to stay out there, especially when the ambush starts. It usually started with they'd have mines, claymores that they got from us in the trees, and they'd electrically shoot those off and then hit us with them, um, either RPGs or recoilless rifles or heavy automatic weapon fire. That's really scary, and it gets old real fast. Um, I was probably in eight of those, that's all. And the last one was it. I'd lost. My courage was gone. I could not have gone back. Thank God I was in a naval hospital in Japan, and I just knew that I couldn't go back, and I was scared to death that they were going to send me back. And I was afraid, what, what is my father going to do? You know, he's so proud of me, and uh, he went through World War II. What a coward I am. That kind of thing. It was terrible. Fortunately, I went home. I was too badly hurt at that point. Too. Marine Corps didn't need me anymore, thank God. <laughs> you haven't mentioned, unless we went by it too fast, and I don't want to hear, Kantian. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very often, situations you were in are not historically thought of as battles, but certainly this one was. It was. Can you tell us about that tonight? I what can. To it there? was, I want to say it was July, August, September of 1967, the North Vietnamese had surrounded Con Tien, and uh, our third platoon was out there. Um, and they began to, the uh, North Vietnamese began to slowly move in on them. Um, I had an opportunity to go out there by helicopter to help with the um, maintenance uh, of, we were putting new radios in the tanks in September of 67. And um, I had a chance to go out there. Uh, they were getting 1,500 rounds of, of rocket uh, uh, all every day. It was unbelievable. They had to live in um, uh, trenches, underground, in hooches. Um, uh, it was really scary for me to be out there. Uh, the third platoon was out there. First platoon was at Camp Carroll. Second platoon at that time was at the rock pile. I was never so happy to get back to Camp Carroll. Um, and, and yet, I wanted to go out a second time. And uh, the sergeant that was in charge of the radios <coughs> putting them in said, I was standing in the LZ, that's the landing zone, to take the helicopter from Camp Carroll to Contien. And he said, uh, where do you think you're going? And I said, I'm going out to Contien again. And he said, the hell you are. Get up. We don't need you out there. You're just in the way, blah, 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 blah. OK. He's a sergeant. I'm a private. A uh, helicopter was hit going into Contien. Exploded. Killed everybody, including Sergeant Day. Um, that's when I started to get scared. 
So a Contien was a battle. Um, I was only out there once or twice during it. Fortunately, I wasn't out there for a long time. By the end of September, the North Vietnamese had been pounded with uh, artillery, mostly B-52 strikes. I would watch them at night from Camp Carroll, flash, 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 the entire horizon, non-stop. Absolutely unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that in my entire life. The entire horizon, flash, 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 these B-52 uh, were dropping 500 pounders all around Contien. And eventually the air, and, and we were working out at um, Camp Carroll. We had 155 millimeter artillery, 105, some 75s, and the tanks were all firing also all around Contien. And between that and the air support, the North Vietnamese thought they had another Dien Bien Phu in the making, but um, they didn't reckon for what firepower we had. They eventually backed up and they tried the same thing at the base to the um, east of it, uh, Quezon, and did the same thing. Uh, that was like in uh, uh, oh, uh, January, December, January, 67 slash 68. I've got some numbers <coughs> here for, for, apropos of what you just said. General Westmoreland decided that you guys were not going to go under siege. There were 4,000 B-52 strikes and 40,000 tons of bombs dropped in this me. area. And you were witness to this. Yes. Four hours. I, my, my guard was four hours. Next guy, four hours. Next guy, four hours. We sat in front of the, uh, we take the machine gun out of the tank and set it up on a tripod right there on the wire. And I watched that, the entire horizon flashing, flashing all night long until the raid was over. But it was uh, sometimes the entire four hours. I, my jaw was just on my, on my, uh, it was unbelievable. I've never seen anything like it in my entire life. How did you wind up in a Tokyo hospital? Uh, on the 24th of January, uh, just about noon, my uh, company commander, his name was Captain Kent. Again, he's from Arlington. Uh, he came over to me and he said, uh, uh, get your tank going. There's an ambush at the foot of the hill and we're going to bust it open. Uh, meet me at the gate. Okay, so I got the tank going, and uh, we grabbed a flame tank as well. Uh, met the captain over at the front gate. Uh, he got on top. We got, I don't know how many guys, there must have been 30 guys, infantry, on the outside of the tank, and down the hill, Camp Carroll, we went, turned to the right onto Highway 9, headed to Camp Low. Uh, on the way, I had my radio on, and I could hear it, fellows in the ambush screaming that they were firing RPGs at the jeeps. Uh, an RPG is a rocket-propelled grenade that, that will pierce the turret of one of our tanks. And I remember thinking, this is if they're throwing RPGs at jeeps, they've got enough to go around. Um, throw me up a couple of beers. They did, and I'm drinking down. By then, I'd been scared a lot. This now is, I've been in Vietnam September, October, November, December. It's the end of January, and I'm scared. Hands are shaking. Um, I'm getting ready. I pull the bolt in the 50 caliber back, and down we go. Uh, there's the ambush. It's some trucks and a jeep, maybe two or three jeeps. I can't tell. Uh, we stop on the outskirts of it, and uh, the captain tries to use the TI phone. That's the phone in the back of the tank. It doesn't work. It gives me hell for that. So well, it worked yesterday, captain. But we went out on a road sweep the day before. Must have knocked it off going through the jungle. All right, so we, I jumped off the tank. We're taking some sniper fire, not bad, uh, on the outskirts of the ambush. Uh, he tells me where he wants me to lay in some rounds of HE in the hills area. I get back on the tank, we lay some in there. About that time, I get nicked in the, right over here, with a fragment of a bullet. Uh, hit the turret, went about 12 different directions. One of them got me over the eye. Um, I'm bleeding down into my eye. Um, we're still firing. About this point, um, company commander gets up on the tank and he said, I think, Chris, I think they're a little bit closer than that. So um, I pulled back the 50 and uh, I threw all of the rounds that I had into the ambush site with the 50. 
ran out of ammunition and the bolt broke on the 50, the cable that pulls the bolt back broke on me. So um, we cranked some of the 30 caliber rounds into that area too. I pulled out everything that I had um, and I saw some movement in the bushes, got a grease gun up and uh, I dropped two or three people there. Then we decided that we, um, we fired some canister rounds, big shotgun rounds, both sides of the ambush. We figured that we had moved them out of there. So um, grunts got on the tank, uh, 20 or 30 guys. And uh, Cap Captain and I said, well, all right, let's go to the bridge here. We'll stop at the bridge, a little footbridge that went over the stream, Camelot River, I guess. We'll let the grunts jump out left and right, and they'll circle around, and we'll drive into the ambush tank, and we'll fire up. We do. Just before we got to the bridge, they hit us with some heavy automatic weapon fire, and the captain um, took two rounds through the back, out through his, through his flak jacket, out through his chest. He was standing right next to me, fell back. Um, instead of stopping at the bridge, I went out on the tank to get the company commander, pull him in. He was bleeding pretty badly. Put a battle dressing on his, in the meantime, the tank kept going, you see, and we went over the bridge and into the ambush site. And the grunts, the infantry didn't have a chance to get off, jump around. Um, in the process of uh, giving him first aid, the first of the RPGs hit, uh, wounded me uh, again in the face. I dragged him up on the turret tried to get him inside, but he's really heavy. Another rocket hit, and it um, wounded me again in the face and on the arms. I got him just about inside, and another rocket-propelled grenade hit, blew him off the tank and wounded me badly. Uh, by then, we had gone across the bridge, the, and I didn't realize that we had. We were right into the ambush, and they were raking the tank with heavy automatic weapon fire, killing all the grunts on the outside. Um, I began firing the 30 caliber, and as I did, some of the grunts were in the way and knocked, shot them off the tank. Um, then there was an explosion, the tank blew up, and uh, I wound up in the grass. <laughs> Your tank blew up? Yeah. Fortunately, it blew me off to the side. Um, and I've got no wounds at all on my legs. Let's say I had a flak jacket on. I wake up and I'm in the elephant grass and there's a couple of guys lying there with me and we're pinned down. That grass has fallen all around us with the automatic weapon fire that they're sweeping through there. And I'm hurt pretty badly. Part of my hand is blown off. I'm a gunshot wound through here. Um, fragmentation wounds up and down my arms, face and head, back of my must have been wounded eight or nine times going into that ambush with pieces of shrapnel from the RPGs. So um, we lay there for about three hours, I guess. Um, I tried to call in artillery from Camp Carroll, but it was hitting some of the guys along the side. So they called in a um, helicopter, uh, gunship. It got hit, went down. Called in a medevac. They got a couple of guys on it. It got hit, went down, blew up. Then they called in these um, jets with uh, napalm and big bombs. Um, one landed so close to me, I swore to God, I was lying, uh, I was trying to open up the earth to get my head <laughs> to bury myself in it. I must have come up that far when it hit. Uh, and it hit on the road, it hit one of the, um, the, the flame tank behind us, blew it all, uh, terrible screams all around. It was not a good day. Finally, Three hours later, four hours later, I don't know. It was late in the day, it was almost dark, so noon to that time, maybe it was four hours, we were pinned down. Finally, a truck came in, and at that point, the North Vietnamese had receded, and they loaded the dead and the wounded on the truck and drove us from, this was about where the Camlo village is, into uh, Dong Ha, and they had a big med field med station there. Uh, I couldn't get off the truck, so they uh, dragged me off the truck and into this MASH unit. And uh, I passed out there. I remember looking at the MASH unit and looking at to my right and to my left, and you don't want to know what was there. 
I passed out. I woke up in Da Nang for about, I don't know, an hour or so, I guess. And then I passed out again. I woke up in uh, Japan, Yokosuka, in a beautiful Navy hospital, clean sheets, Japanese um, young ladies waiting on me. Uh, they didn't use corpsmen there. They used these Japanese um, young ladies that, um, in nurses' outfits that probably cost less money for the government than corpsmen. Uh, and they were just wonderful, kind, kind people. You did so. extraordinary things on that day. You, if I'm, if I have this correctly, you, you were awarded a silver star. You have two Purple Hearts, the Vietnam Cross for gallantry, Presidential Unit Citation, United States Marine Corps Combat Action Ribbon, plus a, probably other stuff I'm, I haven't got here. How did somebody write up what you did that night and that afternoon, and how did they make sense out of that? I don't know. Absolute chaos. I don't know. Uh, Lieutenant Himes uh, was the uh, the uh, I told you he was the lieutenant that went into the field with a second lieutenant, been in the Marine Corps for about a year. Um, he got some details from some of the grunts that were with us as to what happened. Um, in the meantime, of course, I, I didn't tell you all of the details. I'm making radio contact with um, the CP as we go into the ambush. What's going on? What happened? I'm reporting the company commander is killed. I've got a, you know, um, uh, I'm telling them in code that he's killed, that we've got a lot of wounded that were pinned down, um, blah, 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 blah. Um, you're all shot up and bleeding and still you're on the mic and talking to somebody to try and make some sense out of all of this. You wound up in Tokyo? Uh, Yakuska. And it, it's Yakuska. And are, are you on your way home now? Was I didn't know end? that. Was at that, that the point, end of the war for you? It was. I didn't know it at that point. I didn't know it. I was scared to death. I was so scared when I got to the, um, to the MASH unit in Dong Ha, Chaplain came over to me and was rubbing my feet, had my boots off, was rubbing my feet. My feet were cold and I couldn't urinate. And I had probably hadn't urinated since early in the day and my stomach, my kidneys were kill, must have been all bloated, was killing me. And I couldn't urinate. They brought me a urinal. I couldn't. I was scared so much, so scared. My muscles were all. So they had to catheterize me. Um, I was so scared that my bodily functions wouldn't work. I was that scared. I've never been that scared in my entire life. Jesus, that was awful. So um, when I got to Yakuska, uh, by then I was able to, my functions had come back, and my biggest fear was that they were going to patch me up and I was going to go back. I'd already been wounded once and uh, in December, and I went out to the, um, I got patched up and sent right back. I didn't, I, I didn't have any more courage left. Scared. Before combat, before you had gotten into some of those situations, how much did you know about the people you were going to face? Just what I had learned at Paris Island and uh, Camp Lejeune. I guess Was that it they accurate were, information you had been given? No, not at all. There were people just like you and I. Um, we, we were taught that they were just a bayonet bag, that they were just something to be, to be hurt, to, to be, they weren't really human beings, they weren't, they were like animals, dogs, you could, um, or cats, you just kill them, it's all right to do that, that's not, they're not human beings. After six months in Vietnam, how did you feel about that? Well, I felt very badly for the, um, for the people of South Vietnam, that they were, uh, they were blitzed by the North Vietnamese, blitzed by us, blitzed by the French, blitzed by the Japanese. These poor people didn't know which way to go, any which way but loose. They were, um, uh, they were just mauled by by the by the world, by the human race. I felt very very badly for them. Um, the North Vietnamese, I'm still angry with them. I would like. Um, um, I'm still angry at the North Vietnamese. Although, 
for 27 years, I hadn't seen any of the people that were that were that I had served with in Vietnam. And about three years ago, we had our first reunion in Washington D.C. And I had an opportunity to speak with uh, the fellow that took my place as a replacement, and uh, he took over my tank after they fixed it up, put a new turret on it, blah 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 blah, got it action again. He told me that. The North Vietnamese soldiers that were dead, the corpses in that area of the firefight, the ambush, had to be in the hundreds. And it really, and this is a terrible thing, but it pleased me big time. It made me think that I was able to, that I hit, I was able to hit them back. Um, still very angry at them. So when you say the people, the, the, the people of Vietnam, I feel very, very badly for. They probably would have benefited most had we never gone over there. Do you feel you were properly equipped for what you got into? Absolutely. I, was, I couldn't have been better equipped and I couldn't have been better trained. Um, the only deficiency might have been in uh, armor, infantry, support. Or the lack of it. The lack of it. Yeah. How, how about, um, you, you didn't mention officers very often, but when you did, they were being shot down around you as you were. Officers? Uh, officers? Just one officer, uh, my, my company commander, yeah. was killed the, day, the last day I was there. Yeah. Did you feel that uh, uh, he and others gave you good leadership? None, not at all. Over there? Not at all. Lieutenant Himes did. Lieutenant Himes was with us at the rock pile on those convoys to Kalu, uh, to Kantian, to Quezon. Uh, he had been wounded three or four different times. Wonderful, wonderful man. Um, from that point up, there wasn't any leadership. The leadership was the guys that had more time in than you to teach you. Um, and in, in, in the beginning, they didn't want anything to do with you. Um, it's a click, and you develop, you get into the click the more time that you spend there and the more experience you get. Like uh, Gio Lin is in the far northern part of the country, and um, um, late November monsoons, we're throwing grenades with both hands up there. <laughs> and that's a brotherhood, those guys. I don't want to jump to the end of this, but it, at any point from your hospital in, in Japan, and then as you leave the Corps, did the United States Marine Corps ever ask your opinion about whatever happened out there? No. Did anybody care? No. Certainly not the Marine Corps. The last I heard of the Marine Corps was at Chelsea Naval Hospital. I was there for eight months and a fellow came up to me, I don't remember, he was a Marine officer, and he asked me my name and he said, uh, well, I've got some bad news for you. And I said, well, what's that? And he said, well, Marine Corps is not going to be able to use you anymore, son. I said, well, what do you mean? I have another three years to go. And he said, well, we're not going to be able to use you. We're going to make a civilian out of you. And I said, uh, lean over and kiss me, would you? <laughs> Honestly, I did. And he was appalled, turned around, walked off. The next day, I was interviewed by a psychiatrist. And believe it or not, I got 10% disability for bizarre behavior. <laughs> I still have the 10% disability now. You could, I have, you could write your own catch-22. I could. <laughs> I am, I'm 70% disabled. I'm about to go to 100% with the VA. 10% of it is, and, and no one asked me anything about this until after that episode. So it had to do with that. I was so happy. I went back to college in September, got married in September, my girlfriend, um, and off I went. I began my life again. You had a hell of a ride, as, as they say. 1968 uh, was a tough year. <laughs> yeah, that, and one I don't think you'd want to go back through. Yeah, it was tough. In that year, or in Paris Island, or go to wherever you want in your time mm -hmm. in the Corps, was there a, a memorable experience that you sift out from all the others that you come back to? more often than anything else? Well, the last day that I was there. The horrors the of that. The day you got shot up. Yeah, the again. horrors of that. Yet I dream about it all the time. I think about it all the time. 
I'm in stock and shop, helping my wife shop, and we go by the meat market, and I can smell blood um, behind a bus, and the diesel fuel just makes me think of the tank and the um, cordite, the smell gun smoke. This makes me think of that. It wasn't all bad. Um, there was some great camaraderie. As I told you, it was New Year's Eve, 1967-68. We're on a hill now, and you're trying, you, you need to make sure that there's no light, because the snipers on the other side will shoot at that. We were all drinking this jungle juice from Mississippi and beer, and we find these flares that you take the top off, put it on the bottom, pop it up in the air it goes, uh, two or three hundred feet on a parachute and floats down. Well, Happy New Year, we decided to light the entire hill up and we must have, we got the armor drunk and brought him down with us. He opened the armory, in we went, we got these things. We must have shot 40 or 50 of them up in the, well, the entire hill went on alert. They thought they, we were, those flares were coming from the North Vietnamese. I'll never forget our company commander come running out green underwear, helmet on, with his pistol in his hand, wondering where the attack is coming from. <laughs> That's memorable. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Can I get a little sensitive here? Sure. If the Marine Corps uh, didn't ask you what you thought, have you subsequently had anybody help you sleep better? Yes. You get some kind of therapy that I did. Get this out of your I did. Mind. I did. Back in the 70s, um, I had psychiatric counseling with a fellow that really I shouldn't have been with. Uh, he was a psych psychologist, I guess. And then I went to a full-blown blown psychiatrist who had me on all kinds of terrible medications for about five years in the early 80s. Uh, I've been told that I would benefit from um, uh, group therapy, but it's really difficult for me. I see those guys that are in group therapy as the guys on the outside of the tank that really I didn't do a very good job for. Um, I, you know, brought them right into that ambush and got them killed, or killed some of them myself. So I see them, and it's very troubling for me to sit in a group therapy kind of a situation. So the VA has tried a couple of times, but I just I can't do it. I when you met it. with your guys in Washington, Yes. And your group yeah. who had been there, who yeah. had been to Vietnam, um, what did they talk about? Um, well, we reminisced a lot. Um, we welcomed each other back home. And uh, we reminisced a lot. And we supported one another. We, we all had photographs and slides and things. We looked at that and reminisced a lot. Remember the time when blah, 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 blah. And we filled in, a, each one of us to some degree filled in the pages for another. The fellow that took over for me uh, made light of the battlefield after I'd left it. Um, I remember seeing two or three go down that I had shot, but not that extent. It made me feel good to know that we had done um, our share of paying back to them. That killed a lot of those people on the tanks and it was very, it was very angry, it was very frustrating. Um, it was a terrible thing to, to shoot someone else, um, but sometimes it makes you, I don't know, it's crazy, it makes you feel good. And that's an awful thing to say because at the same time it uh, makes you sick. I have to shoot somebody. Thank God it didn't have to be, it wasn't close range. Really. We supported each other, I guess. Mm -hmm. You met a lot of guys uh, starting on the train out of South Station and through P.I., Pendleton and all of that. Sure. How about a memorable character that you can tell us about? Let me see a memorable character. <laughs> well, it would be in Vietnam, I guess. Uh, my, my experiences with the Marine Corps were very negative until I got to Vietnam. Vietnam was, the five months I was in Vietnam was the best period was the best of my tour in the Marine Corps. My, I guess I was in the Marine Corps for about a year and a couple of months. The eight months I was in the hospital, I don't count as being in the Marine Corps. I was in bed. Uh, or if I was out of bed, I was home. Uh, this fellow from Tennessee, now anyone over 20 years old is called Pappy, you know, old man. Uh, and he was like 21, 22 years old, and he was from Tennessee. And he could make jungle juice, uh, liquor, out of anything. And he would take it, 
and bury it and age it in the ground. And I remember uh, he then left. He was with the first platoon and they went to the rock pile. He, everyone forgot where he buried this stuff and one of them exploded. And the, uh, the siren, at, <laughs> they, all went, they thought we had incoming and it was this huge hole in the ground with the container of uh, what he was making jungle juice in. Um, that, and I guess the episode with the flares. Um, and the, uh, the, the brotherhood of, uh, that develops between people that are in harm's way is, is, is almost more substantial, in some cases more substantial than a blood relationship, whether they're black, white. I mean, I, uh, there's a couple of black kids that I knew in Vietnam that sweated with me and bled with me that I think are brothers. I'd kiss them on the lips. And they, their skin their, doesn't mean anything at all to me. It's the closest I've ever been to men, ever. Harry, when and where were you discharged? I, was dis I, was not, I wasn't discharged. I was retired from the Marine Corps in, in October of 1968 from Chelsea Naval Hospital. Um, I went from the Naval Hospital down to the Marine Corps base at Charlestown, where the Constitution is. Mm -hmm. But because I couldn't salute, I'd lost part of my hand, um, they didn't want me around there. So they sent me home to await my retirement papers. Mm -hmm. uh, that was great because I wanted to go back to school in September. And sure enough, I was able to go back. I was married September 1st. Um, um, I started school right after Labor Day. And uh, my, the first school vacation, we had our honeymoon. And so I got back to living again. And you went on through school? You become a lawyer? Yes, I sir. Understand. I got a master's degree. I went to uh, Boston College, got my master's degree. I was in a pre doctoral program at um, BC, and uh, I'd always wanted to go to law school. Why I didn't, I don't know. I got my master's in special education at BC, and I was in a doctoral program at BC in the same thing special education. I took the um, um, special ed law course, and I said, I've got it. I just have to go to law school. And I took the LSATs, did well, and uh, I taught in the special education area for four years while I went to law school, and then right into uh, law practice. That's quite a load you carried there. Yeah, it was tough. Did you join any reserve group no, when sir. you came home? No, sir. Any Nothing. veterans organizations? Nothing. No, sir. Um, are you currently a member of? I'm a member of the Veterans of Our Wars. You are, okay. What kind of reception did you get when you came home? And I, th I think we're talking about the Vietnam reception. Yeah, I didn't get much of a. Well, my, you know, my mother and my father were there. My mother hugged me, and I cried. And my girlfriend was there. Um, when I was admitted to Chelsea Naval Hospital, Corman right there said, uh, "You Christensen? Yeah, your girlfriend coughs. You're going to be here at five. Okay." Um, that was wonderful. My mother, some friends came up to the hospital to visit me. Um, about, I don't know, a month into my stay at the Naval Hospital, must be more, February, March, we were asked, some of the ambulatory patients were asked to, uh, if they wanted to be in the uh, St. Patrick's Day Parade in March in Boston, riding in an open Cadillac. Sure. We're well, we'll going to take us back to the VFW post in South Boston for a few drinks and a dinner. Okay, we got into the car and I was minimally wounded compared with some of the others. There's one kid there that got friendly fire and napalm. His nose was gone, his ears gone, uh, hair all gone. You know what it, those people that are horribly burned look like sitting with me. They had signs on each side of the car, uh, wounded Vietnam veterans, Chelsea Naval Hospital. People were spitting at us, shouting, things at us. I remember the people spitting at us and throwing stuff at us. And uh, I thought that I would never wear the, you know, I just felt dirty and filthy. And so when I got out of the Naval Hospital, I grew my hair long and I wore a field jacket and jeans and fry boots and I blended into the crowd. I didn't let anyone know that I was um, a Vietnam veteran. When you came home from the war, did you sit down and talk with your father about what you'd done? Any member of your family? No. Did he ever ask you? Um, no. Father was not. Um, he's a very loving 
father used to write to me, it would end every letter, keep ducking, son. It's a World War II expression, don't forget to duck. Um, but um, I was home probably for a couple of months. I was driving a cab and it was with my mother and father started to leave to go back out to the car and a bolt of lightning, thunderstorm, hit the tree right in front of the house. Cub, blam, and I lost. I just completely freaked out. I ran through the house screaming, dove into the, got a bicycle and covered it over with me and I was shaking, crying. My father came over to me and he said, to drink some of this and he gave me some um, liquor and my mother came out and I cried. And that was, as close to talking with them about what happened, I guess. He may have sensed more in you than you think. I guess. Yeah. I guess. How important to you was serving in the military in, in the United States Marine Corps? Very important to me. Very important to me. I consider myself a former Marine, and uh, I'm very faithful to the Marine Corps. I think um, it was a horrible assignment that they were given in Vietnam and they did their very best to train each and every person that they were sending into that meat grinder. They did a whale of a job training me. I couldn't have been trained better. And uh, if, God forbid, my courage is gone. They don't have any, any anymore. I couldn't, uh, I would run away from, from fighting. But if I had to go into war, um, those are the people that I want to serve with because they take care of each other. They don't leave anyone there. Anybody hurt, they take out dead, wounded. They don't leave them behind, and they don't. Um, it's a brotherhood that I'm proud to be part of. Semper Fi. As Semper Fi, Mac. What did you think then, and what do you think now about the war you were involved in? I didn't think anything uh, then. I need to survive and make sure that any of my people that were hurt, um, I got them to safety. Um, surviving from day to day and making sure that my people didn't get hurt one way or another, only thing that I thought of. Nothing more than that. Now, um, uh, a measure of my youth disappeared in Vietnam and uh, as I get older I hurt more from my wounds. Um, I need to I need to have when I came home, and that's, we were winning when I came home. That was before the Tet Offensive, obviously. I was wounded just before the Tet Offensive. Mm -hmm. It was for something. It has to have been for something. Otherwise, I don't think I could live with uh, what I did, what I saw, and what happened to me. It had to have been for something. What, I'm not really sure. <laughs> if it was just keeping my, my my people safe, that was enough. It certainly wasn't what I thought it was when I joined. We weren't, we were interfering in a civil war between North and South, just very much like our own civil war. And if we were going to make a military presence as we did in the Gulf, we should have gotten in, won, and then left. But to leave us out there like our government did was, was a terrible, terrible, terrible thing that I'll never forgive our government for, leaving us out there. What was your reaction to Robert McNamara's book when he came I out? I was appalled with it. Um, yeah. His guts are our blood. I've heard that um, referred to with Patton. Uh, his mistakes, our blood. His lies, our blood. 
He doesn't have nightmares, I do. I was appalled, absolutely appalled. You've been uh, with us tonight almost an hour and a half. Ooh. I wonder if there's any one thought, one incident, overarching everything else you've told us tonight that you'd like to leave with your kids or your family, historians that will look at this tape. Yes, I would, I guess. Um, I believe that all of the other kids in my tank were killed, and I survived. And it had to be for something. And I'd like to think that the reason that I survived was to bring back and explain to kids and people that um, shooting other people, making war on other people, is not what God meant to happen. There is a God. He didn't mean for this to be so. And I think that a lot of people that survive combat have the obligation to come back and explain to kids and people um, that it's not something that we're supposed to be doing. Harry, thank you. Thank you well, thank for being you. with us tonight. Thank you for the um, opportunity. It's been a privilege for me. A very eloquent statement. Thank you. <laughs>